hello and welcome back to what are we episode six of the no, podcast I think, I think we're on nine there's no way we're on nine I have we done nine? nine we've done mm-hmm. nine yeah wow wow we really you know and we're still at a healthy uh video to subscriber ratio so we have more subscribers than videos let's hope to keep it that way <laughs> yeah well, let's hope but we're we're a fast approach <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> Anyways, Austin, I'm excited to talk about today's topic. Uh, I hope you are too, because we are going to get real Vatican-y with it. <laughs> That's uh, definitely a word. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, it could be. What, what, what do you know about uh, the Vatican and its secret treasure trove of archives? So, to be honest with you, before I started researching, uh, I didn't know all that much. I know that the you know there's always been some stuff in the Vatican that the Vatican has been associated with some you know a lot of stuff a lot of um controversies mm. um but it's a huge organization it's a very old organization so i guess they're their own, they're their own country now they are their own i mean city state but yes yeah like, their own military uh, it's, it's like uh it's tiny. what would you compare it to like a sovereign state what else is a sovereign state out there um so the principality of monaco that's another oh, yeah. city state because it's like located in what country is that france uh monaco is its own country no but like carlo. yes oh, monte carlo i'm thinking monte carlo where's monaco Monica Monte Carlo is in Monaco. Okay. And that's where um, they do the F1, yeah. Yeah. But Monaco you're right. It's kind of like France, but it's not France. It's its own Yeah, thing. like it's its own country, but I mean like geographically speaking. France, I guess, if you had to yeah. lump it in there. It's yeah. like Washington and DC. I know it's, it's part I know of the US. Politically wrong. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Like DC's like DC. part of the US, but it's mm-hmm. a city state. True. So but anyways, going off of that, um, the archives actually didn't know all that much about and you know a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is it's wild it's quite wild it's all speculation for the most part but truth but well uh there might be some evidence that points to certain things so honestly i am very excited to get into this and Mm. i would love to discuss this but before we do actually i wanted to mention something um so our last episode remember i had mentioned uh Nicholas Bellantoni. Nicholas Bellantoni. That guy. <laughs> yeah, don't you don't have to do that. But yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if you remember. But anyways, I remember you doing this. <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> so I was listening to a podcast, and this was one of the one, you know, those conspiracy ones where it's like, did Hitler die? Kind of thing. You know what I mean? Did he get away? Did was the body they found, was it really Hitler? Um Okay. Wait, so, this was a podcast you were listening to? Yeah, and this guy okay. covers all these, you know. Um, theories and stuff like that and the russians apparently had a piece of hitler's skull and you'll have to i'll try to remember to link this uh podcast i'm talking about down below it's a really good one it's very interesting but um the fragment of skull that they had they allowed the united states to actually analyze it and the man that actually analyzed it was nicholas bellantoni He analyzed Mm. the piece of Hitler's skull. Ironically, he was uh, the one that did the Connecticut skeletons, right? Yeah, yeah. He was the one that... For the vampire epidemic. So, yeah, he did whatever he does. And he actually said that the piece that he got was not... Was not him. How does... How can he... How do you know? Well, you'll have to go listen to the podcast if you want to know, but... Uh, that seems a little... Okay. I don't know how you could tell. Like, like if I had a piece of skull, like, say it was your skull, and I just brought it to some random scientist, he's going to be like, oh, this is definitely Austin. <laughs> I was going to be mean, like, this isn't Austin. I'll be like, honest. He probably won't know. even know who you are. <laughs> they didn't describe the process very deeply, but according to him, it wasn't. However, that's not the whole story. Basically, the ending of that podcast is... Hitler is dead, and they do have his body. It's just that piece was not him. But it was interesting to hear his name crop up, you know, especially with something like that. I mean, that's quite big. I mean, maybe that can be another podcast, like the bodies of, like, Hitler, Osama Bin Laden. We can get really into it, like, the conspiracies if we really want to. Definitely. There's uh, so many conspiracies. There's so much haunted history out there. We're not going to be running out of ideas anytime soon, I'll say that yeah. much. Yeah. But without further ado, let's get into this Vatican story, shall we? The Vatican Apostolic Archive, formerly known as the Vatican Secret Archive, is a central repository that houses over 600 archival funds, or a group of documents. Altogether, there are over 50 miles, and this was hard to believe, there's actually 50 miles, and I guess it's like underground tunnels or something, of 
worth of shelves that are filled to the brim throughout the facility of the Vatican. Yes. Uh, oh. I'm not done. Sorry, I thought you were asking. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this includes a two-story bunker beneath the archive building, and everything that sits upon these shelves is property of the Pope himself, and up until very recently, wasn't accessed by the public. What do you think of that? So, we do cover it a little bit later, but I think that's kind of suspicious. Well, okay. To play devil, you know, advocate, um... I understand to a degree why you don't want just a bunch of randos touching all the documents. Yeah, because that's how you get libraries where everything's ripped up and there's pornography on the computers. Right, right, exactly. Um, So I get that. But on the other hand, it is a little suspicious that there's all these documents that the public is not allowed to view. 50 miles worth of documents. I mean... That's insane. It is insane. That's, I mean, that's unfathomable. Like, I don't know how you could even. And we'll get into it, but they probably got stuff back from like the biblical days and basically whether or not like they have so much information, they probably know everything that went down, at least according to written records, which if you, if that's believable or not is completely kind of subjective because I mean, everything has bias, especially if you go back to the biblical days, like who's to say they weren't weren't spouting misinformation back then. But anyways, what were you going to say? Well, once upon a time, yes, we just got done saying how they're their own country, basically. But, you know, once upon a time, this was the this was the government of yeah. a lot of Europe. To a degree, they still basically, are. Basically, if, you if you're Catholic, like, their word is law. Right. And to a degree, that still remains true. These people oversee every Roman Catholic church in the world. Yep. Their laws and regulations, their the way they do things apply across the board. They handle a lot of issues, sometimes very serious issues, internally, which is crazy if you think about it, you know, that they're allowed to do that. Let's I'll leave it say at that. that the Vatican and the Catholic Church, they, they hold a lot of sway. So back to the archives. So what exactly is included with these documents? Anyways, you may find yourself asking. Well, according to... Archivio Apostolico Vaticano (laughs) itself, the text includes information that pertains to all acts promulgated by the Holy See. What's the Holy See? Because in in Berserk, the Holy See is like, kind of like the Pope. It's crazy. Is that what the Pope is? So as far as I know, and a lot of this is translated (laughs) from Italian to English, so it's a little difficult. Um... But from what I've gathered, the Holy See is basically a, it's the law of the Catholic Church. In a nutshell, the Holy See, this is referring to any charters or forms that reference laws and rules that are enforced within the worldwide Catholic Church. Additionally, you also find all kinds of state papers, account books, correspondence between the Pope and various figures, both within and outside of the Church. I'm guessing like political figures. Yes. Or like... uh, yeah, probably mostly political figures, I, I would assume. Or maybe other, like, holy leaders, well, like it's the Dalai Lama or something. I'm not sure. Political figures, <laughs> um, people who, like, lots of rulers who involve the Catholic Church in their rulings. So, for example, um, you know, I, I don't know my English history super well, but I know that one of the King Henry's. Oh, it's the annul. it's the one that had like seven wives. Yeah, he wanted to annul his marriage, and, and he went to the. Po- I remember that in history. Yeah, he basically. I think he was like the first recorded history of divorce, right? Like he basically invented divorce. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Because like they, he wanted to get rid of his marriage. I forgot why, but I just remember all of his marriages was because he was trying to have a son, and it came down to basically he might have not had the genetic gene to have sons, like only daughters. Because he was wanted, he wanted an heir, right? Right, exactly. <clears throat> Man, that's that's insane that these archives could probably, not probably, but I think it's. I don't remember if it was confirmed, but they basically have the correspondence between him and a king that lived like a thousand years ago. Yeah, don't worry, we'll be getting into it. Speaking of getting into it, the notable scriptures that are held within these archives include the following: a letter from Michelangelo to Pope Julius II regarding wanting to work for, from home, tired of constant interruptions from the Pope during creative process. The original work from home, dude. He invented it. 
petition from Henry the, the Eighth. Okay, it wasn't the seventh; it was the eighth, requesting to annul his marriage with Catherine of Aragon uh, in fifteen thirty. Damn, I can't. Man. <laughs> it's all right. <clears throat> oh, I forgot that that actually led to the creation of the Church of England because I'm guessing the Pope didn't annul his marriage. And so he created his own church that allowed him to. Right. He said, screw this. I'm not, I'm going to yeah. divorce her anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then that was the, the Church of England. I remember that. Also included within the archives is notes relating to the trial of Galileo in 1633 uh, for holding the belief that the earth revolves around the sun, which was deemed heretical by the Catholic Church. Blasphemous. Hey, it's blasphemous, dude. I wonder what <laughs> they thought the earth revolved around. Uh, they thought uh. the sun revolved around the earth. Oh, oh, so it's just like he was just basically saying, no, it's the other way. And they're like, no, 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 <laughs> you can't do that. Pretty much. You're not um, allowed to, to contradict us. We are right. Because this is God's <laughs> creation and nothing. You know, oh, you, it does yeah. not revolve around anything else. Everything yeah, revolves around The earth us. is the center of the universe. Yeah, I yes. get it. Because of creation. That makes mm. sense. Yes. As interesting as these documents are, however... Many people believe that these items are nowhere close to being the most tantalizing keepsakes held within the vast Vatican archives. Uh, according to some folks, there are wonders locked deep inside this holy storage facility that go far beyond what most people would ever believe to be possible. They may even have the ability to change the course of human history, and we'll get into that. <clears throat> the speculated curiosities include a device that can supposedly see anywhere in the past, present, or future. A book that will allow the user to conjure the devil himself. <clears throat> Spooky. Don't know why you'd want that. <laughs> Although I guess like in Evil Dead. Did you ever see the Evil Dead franchise? It's called yes. like the Book of the Dead or like Morello Nomicon. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Uh, the only reason I think I know it's called Morello Nomicon is because like it's a League of Legends item. Uh, another item is information on when the apocalypse will begin. And even in the last item is documents that prove once and for all that aliens exist. Oh, it's going to be great. This is oh, going to yeah. be a great podcast. I had to include that. We have to talk <clears throat> about some aliens. So let's get into it without further ado. Yeah. So if you're if you're kind of like yelling into the, you know, at us being like there's so much more to talk about, I promise we are going we, we to mention know. it. Um first of all, we don't want to keep people here for 2 hours because I don't care who it is, you're not going to want to listen to someone talk for 2 hours. And second of all, you know, these are the most interesting ones. Um a lot of the other stuff, honestly, actually, a lot of the other stuff I believe actually really is in there, but it's more um, trying to save the face of the Catholic Church, not actually, you know, they're hiding these crazy things from us. No, the th these are things are more like if it ever got out, it would look horrendous. Yep. <laughs> so, so with that, society would crumble. <laughs> it, it, it could. I mean, you know, well, at least anyone who's really deeply into this maybe but anyways i digress so let's hop into the first one so that thing you talked about where you can see the past present and future that is actually called the chrono visor so back in 1925 there was a very interesting roman catholic priest named father marcello pellegrino ernetti who worked for the vatican for starters he was regarded as the most capable and experienced exorcist throughout the whole of venice during his lifetime Additionally, he was a popular mu musician who was praised for his ability to carry out Gregorian chants. I don't know what those are. <laughs> oh, it might be the, you know how some churches sing and then there's like a choir. It sounds yeah. like it's just a choir. I think it's stuff, something like that. Some, this is like one of the, like haunting sounding one. <laughs> it's the creepy, it's the creepy church music where they, 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 it's like an opera. Gregorian chant, I think. Let me listen to this quick. Yeah, okay. it's the creepy where like it's a choir and it's like you, they echo and reverb or whatever. Like, oh, I'd love to play it for you, but we'd probably get copyright if we did. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, additionally, he was a biblical biblical scholar and author. His most famous book was actually titled "The Likes and Dislikes of the Devil." How does he know the dislikes? Uh, well, he's and an exorcist. Likes. He was oh, an that's exorcist, true. That's so true. That's he knows. True. He knows a thing or two about warding off the devil. Uh, and he was even considered by many to be a brilliant scientist. Ultimately, it was the latter of these that led to him garnering worldwide fame. Hmm. Weirdly, I don't know why, but scientist. I'm not trying to sound like a jerk. Please, I don't. Hope, I hope no one's thinking I'm being a jerk here. But 
science and religion usually don't tend to go together super well. So it's kind of crazy that he's like a Roman Catholic scientist. I don't know. That's just kind of bizarre to me. I mean, I guess every country needs its top scientist, you know? I guess. I guess it is a little country and it's run by the Roman Catholic Church. So, and if you're somebody who actually, like if anyone's listening who actually understands this stuff, by all means, chime Educate in. Educate us. Yeah, let us know. I'm not like trying to be a jerk here. I just don't know enough about it. So I, I would love even. to know about it. Uh, continuing on, uh, according to Father Ernetti himself, he had created a, dev a device that allowed him to view the crucifixion of Christ. More alarmingly, he supposedly even took a picture of the event as he watched it. Obviously, if this were to be true, this could easily go down as one of the most important if not the most important invention in the entirety of humanity. Father Ernetti, if, okay. I mean, he, he basically said he made a time machine. Yes, he said he made a time machine. He, you know, judging by everything earlier, he kind of sounds like the person who just like, everything you can do, he can do better <laughs> almost. The dude is like the master of all trades. You know, he can do anything. I mean, we all know someone, I feel that actually everything they do, they're just good at it, and they're really annoying. Yeah. As you can imagine, this stirred up quite a bit of controversy. People from both within and outside the church questioned and debated with one another about whether or not this was the truth or a complete hoax. Those who believed in the priest were putting their faith into the supposed photograph, graph, while those who didn't believe were simply unable to believe that a priest and a small team of Roman Catholic scientists created a fully fleshed out and operable time machine. I completely agree with those people because I don't care. And this isn't just it being a Catholic scientist. It's any scientist, anybody who claims I made a time machine. Eh, I don't know. I'm, it's one of those things that I'm very open-minded about and it's something I want to be real. I want someone to create a you know, time machine. Say they did make a time machine, right? And then you're like, well, why has another government's made a time machine? And to put my little tinfoil hat on, it's probably because they probably went back in time, made sure to secure the information for the said time machine and locked it away in the archive before anyone could like replicate it. Could but you know what? That's just my my brain is blown up from that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's okay. <laughs> Speaking of tinfoil hat, uh, Mr. Bones back there has a tinfoil hat. Despite the fact that the debate still rages on in some circles to this day, it should be noted that the picture has supposedly been debunked. Apparently, it has come out that the picture depicting the crucifixion of Christ was not taken with the chronovisor. However, not everyone is convinced of this. Ultimately, we're going to have to leave that one up to you. Um... Me personally. So what did they find? Was there a picture or no picture? There was a picture. Um, but if it's in the secret archives, what, like, did they show it? Did they unveil they it? They did show it. They did unveil it. And this is this is kind of the, th the premise of the archives. So there's a lot of stuff we're going to talk about. Not everything, but a lot of stuff we're going to talk about where it was shown to the public. But a lot of people believe that what they're being shown was mm. not the real thing. And instead, the real thing the non-doctored, whatever it was, photograph, item, whatever, is being held in the archives where only the Pope can view it. Interesting. And yes, and yes we, you, as you mentioned earlier, they opened up the archives, but there is a bit of a caveat that we're going to get to a little later. So, yes. So, in a nutshell, there was a photograph. So, it's a no from me, dog. <laughs> it's a no from you, dog, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it's a no from me. I don't believe there's a chronovisor. I don't believe that the Vatican has made a time machine. But that's my opinion. Hmm. Interesting. What about, what about you? What do you what do you think? I want to believe. I mean, I want to believe. I want to believe all of this. But... I want to believe, dude. The world's just crazy enough that maybe, dude. We'll leave it at that for me. All right. Well, okay, cool. Fair enough. On to the next one. Okay, on to the next. Let's get into the nitty gritty of this one, the Grand Grimoire. So the Grand Grimoire, as you probably already know, Satan is the boogeyman within the Catholic Church. He is the root of all evil, wishes for nothing more than to see the human race fall into despair and agony, rules over hell, you know. Cool if you guy. watch Has Been Hotel, he can <laughs> sing a, a mean musical. He can sing. He's pretty good. Uh, but what's ironic, however, is that the Vatican archives may contain one of the only ways to summon this grand enemy into our world. That's a Why good you position. want to do that? I don't know. 
That's a good position to be in, though. Like, if your enemy, the only way you're, well, one of the only ways your enemy can get you is being held in your one of the most secret places in the world. Just and takes you, one person to go rogue, though. It does take only one person to go rogue, but <laughs> you know, I I don't know anything about mm. this, but to get into the Vatican, to be working with alongside the Pope, to have access to all these things. You have to devote some serious time to this religion, like from a young age. Like most of these people basically have been doing this since they were kids. Yeah. Um, they've devoted everything to their religion, which is to a degree, I think that's kind of commendable that you can do it's, that. It's it's gnarly for sure. Um, it's not for me, but good for you if you can maybe do that. we'll maybe we'll cover cover this in National Treasure 3, dude, when it gets released. <laughs> I don't think it's happening, my friend. I, I think I just read read a rumor that it might. I hope so. I, I love those movies. They're so corny, but I love them. Back to the Vatican. Written by Antonio del Rabina, the Grand Grimoire, also known as the Red Dragon, is a text that was written in either the 13th or 14th century. Contained within the pages are instructions for multiple spells, rituals, other kind of dark magic I saw like making talismans. But most notable of all of these... Uh, however, are the detailed instructions for summoning demons. Okay, so these are the biggest names you can you can summon. Um, from least powerful to most powerful. They are Nibiros, Sergatanas, Furetti, Agawirept, Satanakia, Lucifuge, Astaroth, Beelzebub, and even Lucifer himself. I'm not going to lie to you. I think the only ones that I've ever heard of are obviously Lucifer and... Be as Beelzebub because the Beelzebub's in the song Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. I've heard of Astaroth and Nibiru's. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no. Uh, where'd you hear that? I don't know. <laughs> they just sound very familiar. Yeah, um, yeah I'm pretty actually. Sure I, I think I've heard sat sat uh, Satanakia or whatever because I think that's the name of an anime girl. I think I a, just summoned a demon. I know, <laughs> that's right? What I'm like, saying, the, it's like a chance. But that uh, that that one one is like an anime girl. It's like called Gabrielle Dropout, or like it's the the girls. That's her name, and she's from hell. But she goes to school with like angels and other <laughs> demons. It's it's kind of cute and funny. But anyways, furthermore, back to the Vatican. Uh, this text also supposedly contains spells that allow the user to complete all kinds of amazing or not so amazing feats, which includes winning a lottery talking to deceased loved ones, making oneself invisible. Uh, but unfortunately, this also includes uh, necromancy, uh, enchanting someone to fall in love with you against your will, sounds like Harry Potter, uh, <laughs> and conjuring up demons to do your bidding. Like that of the chronovisor, uh, nobody but the Pope and his closest confidants are likely to know whether or not the Grand Grimoire is actually located within the confines of the Vatican. Uh, however, if one day you see the man with a tall white hat flying around Vatican City, you'll know why. Who has a tall white hat? Dude? The Pope. <laughs> he's going to fly? He's, I mean, if he's flying around, then you know he cracked this book open and he I, did does it mention? Does it mention flight? I didn't see anything about flight. Uh, oh my god, I didn't put that in there. Yes, I apologize. Um, he, this can supposed to make you fly. Yes, I apologize. Um, Damn, I ruined the punchline by not putting the best part in there. Shit. As a side note, this is the only item on the list that you could actually purchase from Amazon. Granted, it won't be the original. If you want one, if you want that one, you'll have to go and ask the Pope if you can borrow his personal copy. <laughs> they sell that on, on Amazon? Yeah, you can get it. Uh, the Grand Grim Grimoire is actually, it is definitely a real book. There's no debate about whether it was real or not. It's just... First of all, is the original at the Vatican? And second of all, can it do everything that you just described? There's, it's one of those things where there's like, depending how it's written, there's like multiple volumes and certain, or just like certain things that focus on a specific uh, topic are one book, you know, so it's been split up so many times and sold and, you know, who knows, maybe you don't need the original to do all this stuff. This one is, for anybody who actually knows a thing or two about religion, this will be down your alley, I guess. This one, I I had to do a lot of research in this one because I had no idea what any of this was. So uh, please bear with me. So the third secret is ironically called the third secret of Fatima. Um, 
Between May and October of 1917, three Portuguese children claimed to be visited by the Virgin Mary at least six times. Eventually, this portrayal of Mary would become known as Our Lady of Fatima. Allegedly, during one visit that took place on July 13th, the deity swore the trio to secrecy regarding three very important secrets. For decades, these confidential messages would be kept locked away until a bishop named Alves Correa de Silva requested that one of the children, Lucia Santos, provide the details of Mary's message. After a little bit of coaxing, two of the three secrets were ultimately, ultimately revealed by Lucia in 1941. They were then shared with the world. The first secret was apparently a very detailed version of what hell looks like. According to Lucia, the Virgin Mary portrayed hell as a place filled with shrieks and screams of the damned and a sea of continuously burning fire that both demons and souls alike were plunged into for eternity. Essentially, this is what every depiction of hell looks like. So there's nothing super creative going on here. I think if you've asked anyone what... But maybe just, this is... Maybe every depiction came from this, you know? I I thought that for a second, but you got to think too. Look at uh, like paintings from the Renaissance. Mm, you know, this is way true, after that. And a lot of those paintings that the Catholic Church commissioned, they depict hell, like she just described. Mm -hmm. But anyways, you know... That was the first secret. The second secret essentially stated that if Russia did not convert to Roman Catholicism, then God would punish the world with famine, devastation, and yet another war. So did they convert? Uh, well, no. And then World <laughs> War I broke. Uh, World War II broke out. <laughs> oh, but what, one had already broken out. One right? had already broken out. Because you got to think, like, and I, you know, well, you're, you're a big history buff, especially with the world wars but mm -hmm. you know what a lot of people forget about world war one is it was almost like multiple wars being fought there were so many fronts and so many agendas and so many things being fought for mm -hmm. you know like, i forget about like, the ottoman empire a lot of the time when we talk about world war one um and russia had their whole thing and then what you year know, did they release the second secret do you know uh 1941 oh oh two of them were both oh they were both yes. 1941 okay yep. okay so no, During the war, war had war already II. started. World War II is already going. So World War, like it's Poland was already invaded in 1939. <laughs> I guess we're gonna get World War Three. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This is a weird one. You know, growing up, I remember like the church. Right, we weren't Catholic or anything, but there were still stories in the Bible that basically our world war would be like the sign of the end of times, right? Then you'd hear the seven trumpets from the sky and mm -hmm. angels would descend and Jesus to fight Satan's armies. And then everyone would be raptured up to heaven. So there's kind of already depictions of like that. So I guess, I guess I see what you're saying is that that's kind of like, okay, well, it's been said. It also feels very propaganda y to me. Like the, the, the reason why we're going to war is because Russia won't convert to, mm -hmm. you know, Roman Catholicism because they're not Roman Catholic. They're or Christian Orthodox, Russian Christian Orthodox. Is that what it's called? I think it's just Orthodox. I don't know. Russian Orthodox. I think it's Russian Orthodox. It's a branch of Christianity. It's just not Roman Catholicism. Oh, yeah. You know what? And if you Google the Bible's description of hell, I think that kind of covers what that girl said. Yeah. yeah. So nothing groundbreaking there. Despite revealing the first two secrets in 1941, the third secret wouldn't be spoken until 1944. Lucia was extremely hesitant to share the secret as she felt she was not allowed to by God himself. Ultimately, when she became ill, she decided to write it down just in case she did pass away. Allegedly, she wrote down the final secret and placed it into a sealed envelope. Catholic authorities swore that the envelope wouldn't be opened up until either one of two things happened. Either Lucia passed away, or the year 1960 arrived. We don't know if they kept that promise. I don't think they did. And we don't know which one came first. Um, the reason why I say that is because, despite being allowed to share the secret with the world after 1960, the Roman Catholic Church did not disclose the secret to the general public until June 26, 2000. 40, mm -hmm. years 40 years later, mm -hmm. according to Pope John Paul II, the following was depicted in the message. <clears throat> okay, this is about to get real Jesus-y, so give me a second. Uh, 
We saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand. Flashing, it gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. Pointing to the earth with his right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance, penance, penance. And we saw an immense light that is God. Something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it. A bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men, and women were just going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough hewn trunks, as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city, half in ruins and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with sorrow and pain. He prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way there, died one after another the other bishops, priests, men, and women, religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross, there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, in which they gather up the blood of the martyrs, and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. I have no idea what any of that I th- means. I, so I think if you <laughs> Google Third Fatima Secret, which I just did, there's like pictures depicting what you're describing, kind of. Yeah. And so, it's uh, it's interesting. Yeah. So, okay. Essentially, I know I just, to be honest, I really don't know what this means, but what a lot of people have gathered from it and what I am able to gather, this is depicting the end of the world. However, yeah, it's not specific. It leaves lots of room for imagination. I mean, that's kind of, okay. You know, I can't that, say that, but religion. Yeah, just, I know where you're going with it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Dude. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I think everyone listening knows what you're saying. Um, I'm just, I'm not going to say it though. That's okay. But I'm saying it without saying it, <laughs> but I'm not saying it. So anyways, this is kind of up to your discretion. So Much like most most of these podcasts. Right. So let me just give you the rest and we'll go from there. As you can imagine, that felt like quite a lot of rather ambiguous information for most people, myself included. Due to the lack of specifics, people began to speculate that the supposed third secret that had been revealed to the general public was actually a lie, or at least significantly trimmed down. So you know, so why this, did they think that? Because they thought it was too ambiguous? Well, if you look at the other ones, mm-hmm. the other They were kind of direct, right? They're very direct, very specific. This is not. This is very, like, this feels like something you would read out of any religious script. You know, it's left the other two interpret. just felt The other two just felt like something that, like someone could easily remember. This one didn't seem so easily rememberable. Oh, it God, was very no. descriptive and very... Like, the other one is what? Hell's this and that. And then it was... If Russia's not doesn't change religion, war will break out. And then this one was very descriptive. I can't even re- I can't even recite the the gist of it. To be honest, if when I was reading that, like you know, your eyes were just getting glassed over, and you were yeah, like if you were told if you were going to tell me to say, hey, I'm gonna read this to you, and then kind of like give me the gist of what I just said, I I don't know. I'm gonna have to put some music over that to make it somewhat interesting <laughs> because I was reading it was like, oh my god, I don't even remember. Put what I uh, <laughs> some Gregorian chants over that. Dude. Yeah, we'll do that so you can hear what it is. All right, so there's a little more. <laughs> um, as a result of all of this, speculation has run rampant, with some believing that the third secret of Fatima predicts an apocalyptic battle between good and evil, of which mm. deeply involves the Pope. Some even believe that the actual date and circumstances surrounding the apocalypse may be included within the real third secret. If this were to be true, you can probably see why the Vatican would never want that truth to get out. I mean, because they would, so they could get ready for war, right? Well, maybe they know the outcome. All right, Dr. Strange. (laughs) I... I saw a million. Oh, you know ways. what? With the chrono, with the chrono visor, though. Maybe I saw a million ways in which this battle went. How many did we win? One. <laughs> uh, so maybe I don't know. You know, this is this is an odd one. That is by far the most like. What is it? Art imitates life, dude. Art imitates life. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I uh, I 
do actually believe that that is the third secret. Although, if you want my honest opinion, wait, what's the third secret? That what they said. I don't think that huge description. Yeah, I think that's actually it, and I think that a lot of this these secrets. Okay, these are children. So, do you believe these secrets? No, I don't believe these ones. The the Fatima secrets. I do not believe this. I don't believe it's ever happened. I'm sorry. You these don't think three... these kids came up with it? Or you think they were fit? How do you think these kids did it? Do you think they they were coerced? I think they got bored, to be honest with you. And all um, three came up with the same secret, though? Well, because did they... Okay, here's what... Did they know each other? They're siblings. Oh. And the only person to spew the secrets was Lucia. By the way, don't ever trust Lucia with your secrets, because if she can't keep a secret from God himself, <laughs> she's not going to be able to handle your secrets. Well, what if it was a test and she failed? I don't know. Well... If that is true, and I don't want to Wait, know where so she is Wait, right so she's now. the one that said secret one and two, and the other siblings never said it? Yeah, all three of these secrets came from her. Oh. So, Why didn't the other two say anything? I don't know. She, she was the one who was grilled and not the other kids. Interesting. So That's that's an interesting one. It I, is I, interesting. I don't want to do some more reading on that. So, But so, yeah. secret number four, if we were to continue, uh, is the Vatican possesses extraterrestrial artifacts. Yes. <laughs> so aliens, baby. My, the best one of all. And you know, maybe he does. We'll get into it. But uh, when compared to the other secrets that we have mentioned thus far, the idea that the Vatican is hiding away proof that extraterrestrials exist may seem a bit out there. That's that's. I'm not going to read that part. You need Funnily, to read it. Read no, it. I'm not. I'm not. Read it. <laughs> pun fully intended. Okay, and, funnily enough, however, this theory may actually have a little more evidence to back it up when compared to the previous ones that we have discussed thus far. Um, for starters, did you know that the Vatican has a personal observatory? And basically, for you don't know, it's like kind of those giant hub telescopes. Uh, and deep within the hills of Castel Gandolfo lies the Vatican's observatory. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was, I was actually going to ask you, did, did you know that they had an observatory? I had no clue. Me neither. I was quite surprised to hear that one, yeah, to be honest. That's the, do you think there's pictures of it? Castel oh, there, it's very public. Like, well, Gandalfo Observatory. Don't read too much into it because there's something coming up. They're going to be like, what? Okay, I just want to. Ju I just want to look at it. Yeah, it's a little dome-shaped building, giant telescope. That's cool, man. Deep within the hills of Castel Gandalfo lies the Vatican's observatory, and currently this is being managed by their chief astronomer, Brother Guy Consolmagno. Uh, who is an American from Detroit. Uh, feel free to look it up, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah he, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, had to put I, wonder, that. I wonder how you get that gig if you're a Detroit, Michigan man. It's like, so this guy, he went to the University of Arizona. Um, he, Party got, school. he got his, well, he has multiple PhDs. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I don't know how he scored this gig. It's just... I when I imagine the Vatican, people, not important. <laughs> when I imagine people working in the Vatican, I picture a lot of Italian, Italian men. people. Yes, Italian men. And this guy is just rocking up from Detroit. Hey, He's like, "Hey, what? I'm from Mopar Nation." You know, you're like, going to tell me you're going to tell me he doesn't have access to the Vatican. Probably not archive. Uh, but officially, the Vatican uses the observatory for the purpose of studying our solar system. Uh, however, there are whispers the Planets and stars aren't the only thing they are studying. Uh, one piece of information that has fueled the suspicion is that the Vatican itself has hired people to investigate whether aliens could exist and what that would mean for the Catholic Church. According to an NBC article, this happened at least twice, once in 2005 and again in 2009. In each of those investigations, the Catholic Church hired all kinds of experts who were well-respected within their field. Uh... It's odd, but they legitimately hired people to basically give their two cents on like, hey, do you believe aliens or exist? What what are the odds? And if they do, what does that mean for us? <laughs> and um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. Um, they actually, well, you'll get to it, but the conclusion was actually not what I was expecting, to be 100% honest with you. Well, let's get to it, shall we? Uh Interestingly enough, when it comes to the aliens, their conclusion was that nothing can be ruled out regarding the existence of life beyond our planet, which I agree with. Uh, additionally, 
they add that the discovery of alien life wouldn't contradict the Catholic faith, uh, which is kind of ironic since like, I mean, Galileo was tried because he said the sun was the center of the universe. And now they're saying that like, there's other life on other planet. I don't know. Uh, instead, the Catholic church claims that if life exists elsewhere, then they would simply be a part of God's creation. And obviously, this is far from a confession, but it does make you wonder if something aside from simply being open-minded has pushed the Vatican to make such claims. So that always, out of all the ones we've read, this one kind of makes me a little, it makes me stop and think a little mm. bit. Um, because kind of going back to what I said earlier when we were talking about the chronovisor, um, how I was kind of half joking about, you know, what the, the last thing visor. the last thing I think about is science and church going together. And the fact that they're like, you know, because I can guarantee you at least half of the people that they hired are probably atheists, to be honest with you. I feel most people and, in the science unless field, he's a scientist like uh the guy that made the chronovisor, like you said. Right, maybe. But these are like a lot of people from all over the world. So these are American scientists, French scientists, Italian scientists, British scientists, German, probably Russian. You know, there was nothing crazy going on back then. Um, anyways, all over the world, you know, people who are not necessarily a part of the Catholic Church, they hired to come do this. And the fact that they were this interested in in this situation, why all of a sudden are they so interested? You know what I mean? Because you got to think, too. So what do you think it is? What do you think is the ulterior motive? Well... Let me just give you one more second. So back in 2005 and 2009, it was a, and it wasn't that long ago, but it was a different world back then. You know, this was still at a time when aliens being, weren't mainstream. The only mainstream thing about aliens was they were in movies. That was it. You know, people, yes, people believe, but it wasn't being plastered on the news. Like the stuff we've talked about before where, you know, the the government's declassifying you know uaps and showing us that was not happening in 2005 2009 it that stuff happened in those years but it wasn't being disclosed to us so for an organization like the catholic church to come out and be like hey um there are we need to talk about aliens at this time that is suspicious to me if they were doing it now it actually wouldn't be that suspicious to me because it's, you know, we're all talking about it. There's a lot of people I personally know who do believe in that stuff. So it would make sense for them to kind of get ahead of the curve and talk about it. But why were they talking about it back then? That's the crazy thing. So it makes you believe in aliens is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, I do. I do believe in aliens. I've always believed in aliens. <laughs> um, I think it would actually be crazier if aliens didn't exist, to be honest with you. Um, Given all the secrecy about it. Well, yeah, and explain flying objects we see the Congress talks about. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I don't know what I believe in terms of if you know they are you know does the ones the stories them with working with the government. I don't know if I believe in those ones, but I do believe that at the very least they're watching. You know, they're like, hey, what are these idiots going to do next? They're watching me pull my. Never mind. So <laughs> for like the third time today. <laughs> Anyways, Austin, how about we get to that conclusion? All right. Okay. Um, do you got anything on that at all? Honestly, I think you pretty much covered it, okay. but it is kind of interesting. I, I never considered that point of thought of like that they were talking about this like 15 years ago before everyone else was really. Right. Before it was um, popular to talk about. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Kind of odd. So today we have discussed all kinds of artifacts that are supposedly being held within the Vatican archives for the most part. All of this is pure speculation, and unfortunately, we really don't have much to go off of in terms of concrete evidence. And if you were to ever bring any of this up to any Vatican official, they probably would call you crazy and then laugh you all the way out of Vatican City. Curiously, the Vatican has stated the title of Vatican Apostolic Secret Archives is actually just a misunderstanding of translation. The Latin adjective secretum from Cicerner actually means to separate, distinguish from, or to reserve. In this case, the Vatican claims that the title simply means that the archives are the personal collection of the Pope. Hmm. Essentially, they are saying that there are no secrets and there never have been any. Translation issues aside, however, 
there are a few facts that make me think twice about what is actually going on within the Vatican archives. One is that despite becoming accessible to scholars in 1881, the archives were actually withheld from public viewing prior to this year. Before this, only the Pope and people he deemed worthy could view the archives. Additionally, despite the archives becoming publicly available for viewing over the coming years, there still is currently a limit to how many texts one can read at a time. This becomes a bit concerning when you consider how much of the archives has yet to be explored and translated from Latin into other languages. Furthermore, all personal documents from popes throughout the 1900s to today are still not available to the public. Why is that? I don't know about you, but it sure sounds like much of the archives are still a secret to me. Dun, dun, dun. So going off of that stuff, this is the kind of part we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, where these are the things I actually tend to believe is the case. And by all means, feel free to look this up. Other people believe this too. So a lot of not so great stuff. So keep in mind, the Catholic Church, as we all know, any entity that's as old as this entity has done bad things because they were around at times when a lot of bad stuff was completely acceptable. So I'm not saying that absolves them of anything, but... Sounds like you are. But it's... <laughs> I promise I'm not. But it's easier to be like, well, you know, it was the 1400s, so live with it, unfortunately. Just boys being boys. <laughs> Pretty much. However, especially when you when people today are looking at it, from 1900 on is kind of almost like when the free pass has ended. Um, and if you think about it, what happened between then and now? We had a lot of world wars. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff regarding what their stance was during World War II. Um, some people believe that if Vatican City was spared during World War II from any attacks because certain deals were made, um, this, these thing, things that could either prove or disprove this would be in the Pope's personal um, diaries. And those are held in secrecy. And the Vatican admits this. You are not allowed to go view these things or these journals. I don't know if you'll ever be able to view them, but at the moment, you are not allowed to view these. That is suspicious <laughs> to me, personally. Um, it definitely it leaves kind of much to the imagination in terms yes. of what it's possibly covering. Uh, but that's neither, that's not for us to decide, I guess. But Agreed. Agreed. It, it definitely makes you think. Like my hope is that, you know, like you said earlier, there are the stuff we can look at. There are 50 miles worth of reading materials, reading material. And all of it for the most part is in Latin. Yes, there are people who can speak Latin, but the vast majority of us cannot. Um, it's a dead language, technically. Technically, yes. So, yes, we have access to 50 miles worth of knowledge. However, it, it all needs to be translated and decoded. And people need to find the context and understand what was happening at the time the book or the document or the charter or whatever it was was written to fully understand everything. So we have a long way to go before we start understanding all of what the Vatican archives have to offer us. Um, so I guess we'll just have to be patient and hope that, you know, we get a lot of honest scholars in there who do their jobs and are very transparent and are more interested in the truth rather than saving face. Hey, you know, maybe if you become a doctor, maybe you can do that. <laughs> maybe. I mean, technically, we're all, you were in college, if you went to Scotland, if you went to Scotland, if you went to college, you're technically a scholar. I studied a dead degree. Yeah, well, join the club. Anyways. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but that, my friends, is the tale of the Vatican Archives. Um, it's honestly probably something before, so I had never really heard of that, about it until we kind of went into the prep this week. Um, it's really interesting to find out about, uh, honestly sounds batshit to me but at the same time it's like who doesn't love a good batshit story oh yeah of course they're the best ones but uh let us know what you thought what you think about it let us know if there's any topics you want us to cover in the future just comment or let us know email us at uh, you go first is it mysteries 
pod. Just you go first. No, it's you. Oh, wait. What's the email, dude? It's you go first dot TV at gmail.com. At gmail .com. Okay. Uh, hit us up. Still don't think anyone has yet, but you know what? You could be the first. Uh, subscribe to our sister channel at you go first gaming. Uh, you'll find us there playing scary video games. Maybe one to two videos a week. We are at about 227 subscribers, so help us get up there to about 250, maybe. That'd make be really great. Happy. Make us really happy. Uh, but without further ado, you got anything left to say? Uh, my final thought is, I won't spoil what it is, but be ready to talk about aliens next episode. Ooh, I'm a actually whole, super excited, dude. A this whole is episode. what we've been aliens. waiting for. I mean, we kind of talked about Phoenix Lights, but let's get really into it. I got one that I think this is one of the most crazy ones out there yes the phoenix lights was cool and lots of people have seen it but this is another highly witnessed event and some people get up close and personal with the aliens in this one okay dude i'm ready dude so that's uh, gonna be awesome there's your teaser and i guess that's all i got for final thoughts all right well thanks everyone for tuning in and like my co-host likes to always say stay spooky my friends see you everyone <laughs> bye bye